Praise be to Hashem. Welcome everybody. It's good to be here once again. And today's topic we shall be debating is Isaiah chapter 11. Rabbi Elijah Michaels, uh, if the Mashiach is God, how is it that God can fear God? Okay, so before that um, question can be answered, we first must have to find out if the one being of God is split up into two or three different persons in the one being of God. If we cannot prove that by looking at the three T's, which is the Torah, the Tanakh, and the Talmud, then uh, there's no question to be asked. Okay, And what I would like to do today is, like in Isaiah 41, um, God says to the children of Israel, bring your strong reasons to me that we could debate with God, okay? As in Job chapter 1, it said there was a time that the sons of God would appear before God and Satan came with them. To do what? To debate, to bring the strong reasons to God. And in the Tanakh, the Art Scroll, the Stone Edition, it says, commenting, Rashi commenting on Job chapter 9 verse 6, that Satan is the wicked one. So, if the wicked can bring their strong reasons and God listens, it's good that we can listen to one another. And if we don't develop that skill first, then we're going absolutely nowhere. So I thank God that you're here today to listen um, as I do also to others. Praise be to God. So on that note, I'd like to thank the many people that email me um, some Jewish brothers, I think Avram, who has his own line, um, who'd made some wonderful comments that disagreed with me about Ezekiel, John Wiseman, Brother Tony, you know, and many other people. So I would like to thank you for your emails. It's been very interesting reasons, especially those uh, your objections that have been strongly opposed to mine. And that's the sign of peace. If we can't live together, and talk together, listen together, though we have different um, opposing ideas, then we don't deserve to be on this planet. So we thank, be to Hashem, that we um, can have the strength and humility to be able to listen to one another. Okay? So the question that um, we have to answer before we go any further is the one God made up into two or three persons, and we do we see that from the Tanakh and the Torah, okay? If not, then there's nothing to answer. Just like if you look at the Quran, the Quran um, teaches that Jesus was not crucified. God made it only look like he was crucified. So you see, the, the blame can be put at the footstep of Allah then, because if Allah made it look like Jesus, the Messiah, was crucified, but he wasn't. Therefore, it's Allah's fault for making people believe that Jesus was crucified and died for our sins. And do we find the same problem in the Torah? Is there writings in the Torah that make the Christians believe that the one God is... Uh, more than one person in that God. Okay, so that's what we'll be looking at, the evidence inside of the Torah. So this is part one. And in part one, we'll be looking at evidence in the Torah, Tanakh and Talmud, which relates to the nature of the one being of God, whether it's totally singular, which is Yakad, or is it Ikad, two or three together making one. Okay, so this is what we'll be dealing with now. If we read the Shema in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, Shema, Israel, Hashem, Elenehu, Hashem, Ikad. And what the Ikad uh, means is 
two or three things becoming one. Now, the way I get that from is if you um, were to buy this book by the Rebbe, okay, it's called Exile to Redemption, Volume 2, on page 16, he says, Ikar means indivisible unity. And also, if you get Rabbi Nachman's book by the Breslev called Mashiach, um, he also, in the book, says the reason why God uses the word Ikar, meaning that everything concerning God is unity. And that's why in the Shema, when God is talking about himself, he uses Ikar. The Lord thy God is Ikad, which is one, which is indivisible unity, things coming together as one. Now, that's one of the reasons why we believe the nature of God is um, three persons coming together as one. Like we see the word Ikad used in Genesis um, chapter 1, um, where God said, um, sorry, Genesis 3, where God said about Adam and Eve, these two shall be Ikad, which is one. Also, um, after the fall of man, God said, man has become like Ikad, one of plural us. Again, references that God uses with Ikad. Why did God not use the Hebrew word Yakad, which would mean one, not unity becoming one, just one. Nothing else can join in with that. He does not here use the Hebrew word yakad, but he uses the Hebrew word ikad. So from this, we can see that God is giving us permission to see him through unity rather than singularity. Okay, now we'll go on to the next part, which is the evidence of the plurality of God expanding in the Torah. If we look at Tehillim chapter 83, verse 18, here's what the scripture says. You alone, Hashem, are called Yahweh. Okay, you understand the clarity of that? Meaning that only God can be called Yahweh. And remember, we're dealing with the question, can God fear God relating to Isaiah chapter 11? Okay, so if only God can be called Yahweh, according to Tehillim, Psalm 83, verse 18, then absolutely the Mashiach could never be God because there cannot be Yahweh fearing Yahweh. However, if we look at the next verses, you go into Exodus chapter 23, verse 20 to 23. God begins to talk and say, he will send his angel ahead of Israel and beware of that angel because he will not forgive your sins. I thought it was only up to God, Yahweh, where the sins are forgiven or not. Like unto Abraham in Genesis 48 verse 16, he's speaking to God, Yahweh, who's looked after him and etc, etc. And then he shifts it also, he can't, to the angel who delivers him from all evil. Well again, it's only Yahweh that delivers from all evil. So why would Abraham um, equate that with Yahweh. I beg your pardon, it, not Abraham who prays that prayer in Genesis 40, it's Jacob who prays that prayer. So, and then on the rest of Exodus 23, verse 20 to 23, Moses finishes off by saying that um, he will not forgive your sins, meaning the angel, because my name Yahweh is in him and then we have great debates that developed between great rabbis concerning the confusion that that brought 
if you go to Sanhedrin in the Talmud, 38a, again, there's a comment that Yahweh then says, go up to speak to Yahweh. And, and they say that the angel Metatron was given the name Yahweh. So here we see now that somebody else can be called God. Now there that fits into just for beginnings, um, Isaiah 11, that God feared God. Somebody called Yahweh feared somebody called Yahweh. And of course that develops later into Haggai in the Talmud 14a, where great rabbis Akiva and Yossi debate over an experience they have in Ezekiel um, chapter 1. So in Ezekiel chapter 1, you see in verses 26 to 28, Ezekiel sees um, thrones of God, and then he sees a man sitting upon that throne. And the last verse, 28 of Ezekiel 1, it said, with the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Yahweh. So here we see again somebody else, which was a man, being called the name Yahweh. Now, this caused so much hot debate that it was banned. This scripture was banned from being taught except by very learned rabbis for many, many, many years. And also, it is actually thought that it is so controversial that it's not able to be understood except till Elijah came. Why? If you look in Haggai 14a, that Rabbi Kiva was so convinced when he came back, he saw a vision of this very same thing with four other rabbis. So with five of them had an experience in heaven where they all saw the same thing. And when Rabbi came back from that experience, he said, there must be, watch this, two Ikad powers in heaven. Okay, meaning two people called Yahweh, which of course Rabbi Yossi then debates him. And as a result, and Rabbi Akiva becomes quiet, but another rabbi called the Rabbi Elisa, he stuck to his guns and said, no, there was two people called Yahweh, two powers in heaven. And as a result of it, he was then called Akon, which is the man with no name, which at Yom Kippur, in the Vita Vita Balm, they have a, a whole segment which they read every Yom Kippur concerning that rabbi, that that experience was so powerful for him, he couldn't deny that there was two Yahwehs in heaven, okay, which we see in the scripture. Now Ezekiel goes on to have an experience with that man Yahweh in Ezekiel 43, and if you turn to verse 5, I'll read it for you. Then the wind, which is the spirit, lifted me up and brought me into the inner courtyard and behold the glory of Yahweh Hashem filled the temple and I heard him capital H which means Yahweh addressing himself to me himself from the temple and there was that man standing next to me and what does that man say son of man this is the place of my throne and the place of my footstool where I will dwell amongst the children of Israel forever. So here we see that Yahweh now speaking to Ezekiel. And this is why the rabbis say that the book of Ezekiel is impossible for us to understand. Now I put it to you. Now you can see already just this far, why the Christians see from Isaiah 11, the Mashiach, 
with the name Yahweh, could fear Yahweh. But quite clearly here we have a man with the name Yahweh, the angel um, in Exodus 23, verse 20, 20 to 23, the only one, according to Talmud Sanhedrin 38a, that is given the name Yahweh, whereby now Yahweh, someone called Yahweh, can fear Yahweh. Now, if you find it difficult to grasp um, some of those, this segment that I said, because it's, you know, sometimes we can, it takes hours to be able to look at different things. Now let's look at more evidence concerning the nature of God when he is talking, okay? If you turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, verses 21 and 22, here we have Yahweh speaking. To Moses. And Yahweh says, Yahweh said to Moses, Descend and warn the people, lest they break through to Yahweh to see. So now you have Yahweh warning Israel not to break through to Yahweh, which is again spoken in the third person as if that Yahweh is somewhere else. Now, if you don't see that that matches, let's read the next verses. Um, it is verse the 24 and 25 of the same chapter. Yahweh said to him, Go descend, then you shall ascend, and Aaron with you, but the cord and the people, they shall not break through to ascend to Yahweh. So it's like a sham Yahweh is separate from the Yahweh that he's warning the people not to uh, send to. Now, this matures itself. If you go to Exodus 24, it said, it says, verse 1, and Yahweh is there with Moses, with him, and says to him, go up to Yahweh. Again, somebody else who has the name Yahweh. And of course, if you read in the book of Exodus chapter 34, chapter 34, verses 5, you see something unusual happening. It says that Yahweh descended in a cloud and stood with Moses, okay? And then he calls out to Yahweh, the name Yahweh, and begins to say Yahweh this. Be sorry, the name Yahweh and Hashem, then Yahweh passes before him. So you've got Yahweh standing with Moses, calling out Yahweh, then Yahweh passes Moses. And then Yahweh begins to Yahweh is this, and Yahweh is that. Now, in the art scroll, which I'm reading it from, the stone edition of the Hebrew, the commentary says this, okay, by Rabbi Yochanan, says this, were it not written in the scripture, it would be impossible for us to say it. This passage teaches us that God wrapped himself in talus like one leading the congregation in prayer to Yahweh. You see what Rabbi Yochanan says? If this wasn't written, they couldn't even speak it, that Yahweh is now praying to Yahweh. So there we have, again, proof that something, confusion is going on because it deeply looks like even to the rabbi, even to the confusion of Akiva and Yosef and other rabbis that have gone to the heavens and seen the two Yahwehs, that it looks like Yahweh is praying to Yahweh. Now this 
is where the Christians from the Tanakh, from the Torah, and from the Talmud believe that Isaiah 11 is quite correct, that Yahweh fears Yahweh. That indeed, the Ikad is more than one person in unity is one. The three persons inside of the one. For according to Deuteronomy, God says to Moses that no man can see the form, the image of God. But if you turn in your Bibles to Numbers 12, verse 8, God speaks in rebuke to Miriam and Aaron and said, Moshe sees my image, my form, but you do not. So it seems there's Yahweh, whom you cannot see the image, but the other Yahweh, that you can see the image. And of course, you turn to Exodus 24, verse 1 and 7, that God, Yahweh, says to Moses, go up to see Yahweh. Me you cannot, but him you can. And so when Moshe goes up, 74 people, it says in verse 7, see Yahweh, Yahweh, with their own eyes, the God of Israel standing there and are surprised that he doesn't stretch forth his hand against them. Why? Because you're not supposed to see God and live. So there we can see that one Yahweh you can see, but the other one you cannot. Go back again. Can Yahweh fear Yahweh? And all fear means is not in awe of. Okay? That Yahweh is in awe of Yahweh in its purest sense. Yahweh loves Yahweh. Yahweh talks to Yahweh. So here we have something very peculiar going on, showing the ikad of Yahweh. God is plurity, and more than one in unity in the one being. And if you turn in the, the Torah to Exodus chapter 16, verse 13, we see that Hagar has an experience of seeing Yahweh, the one with the name Yahweh. As I've shown you, there's one with the name Yahweh you cannot see, but one with the name Yahweh that you can. Okay, when God said, let us make man in our image. We were made in the image of Yahweh. And as Hagar sees Yahweh. This is what she says. She called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her, you are the Yahweh of vision. For she said, could I have seen even after having seen? It's meaning that how could she still be there after seeing God him Self. So there you have the, the, the one part of God you cannot see, but the other part of Yahweh that you can, which is the testimony. And of course, the same experience happens in Genesis 18, when Yahweh talks with Abraham and, of course, the experience of Ezekiel. And this is the reasons why Christians believe that Yeshua came down in the likeness of, of man was that Yahweh that appeared to Hagar in physical form, that Yahweh that appeared to Moses, that Yahweh that the 74 elders saw with their own eyes and were shocked that they still were living afterwards. Uh, that is the same Yahweh that Akiva, Rabbi Akiva, and four other rabbis saw 
and caused them great confusion as they saw two Yahwehs in heaven. These, this is the same Yahweh that we believe is Yeshua coming down to pay the price for sin, who we call the Son of God. Now, part two is very short. We we'll deal with um, completely outside of the, the Torah and the Tanakh. We're going to go into to Talmud experience where you have three rabbis, Rabbi Kiva, the Bel Shem Tov, Rabbi Bel Shem Tov, and uh, the Rabbi Joshua Ben Levi. These are three very famous rabbis. Um, Rabbi Kiva is more from the first century um, after, after uh, BC, sorry, um, uh, um, after Christ. Um, then we have the um, uh, Papa, um, not Rabbi Joshua Ben Levi, um, Joshua Ben Levi. He is would be three hundred years um, after Christ, and then we would have Bel Shem Tov, which is fifteen hundred years after Christ. Now these three men have experiences meeting the Mashiach. Okay, now and then out of these three experiences, that they, they go on to do great things in their life, uh, right? So the question would be, why is it that the Mashiach is the only person ever to be seen and talked to before he is born? The great King David was not seen before he was born. Moses was not seen and talked to before he was born. There is no man in the Torah and the Tanakh, Solomon, David, Elijah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Ezekiel, not one of them was seen and talked to before they were born. They are all prisoners inside of time. Why? Because they are men. They are not Yahweh. But the Mashiach, is the only man to transcend time like Yahweh does. The name of Yahweh that God said to Moses was called I am he that was and is and is to come. Tell them that he that was and is and is to come has sent you. And that's the same Yahweh, okay, that the Mashiach, okay, this the same power that he's able to do. The only one able to come out of time, he he also is able to be that which was, is, and is to come. The power to transcend and time travel, which no man has. And of course, he wouldn't be able to do that, except... As God himself says, for in him is my name. He can be in the past and in the present and in the future all at the same time. So the next question to ask, if these experiences with the Mashiach is true, where in the Torah and the Tanakh, do other great men have the same experiences talking with the Mashiach? Because Ecclesiastes said there's nothing new under the sun. So to be able to prove that your experience was of God, we first must see proof of it in the Torah and Tanakh. So where does the same Mashiach who he alone is able to transcend time, make his appearance to the prophets like he does, Akiva, Bel Shem Tov, and, and Joshua Ben Levi. Where? The person was the Yahweh that appeared to Hagar, the Yahweh that appeared to Abraham, the Yahweh that appeared in Exodus 24 to Moses and the 
elders. The Yahweh that Isaiah sees in Isaiah chapter 6 to Isaiah shocked. He said, woe unto me, because he saw Yahweh. That is none other than the same Mashiach who transcends time that appeared to these famous rabbis. And if it's not the case, what I say, then these rabbis have had an experience which is alien to anything that's inside of Scripture. Now, the, the third part we're going to deal with, again, is God man? Because that's the question that people are going to throw. They seem to ignore all the other points, which part one and part two, if you examine these reasons, which cause great rabbis confusion, how on earth could you expect it not to cause the Christian, the Gentile nations confusion? And to understand the reasons why we do believe what we believe. Now, the part three we're dealing with is God man. The verse that people throw up is Numbers 23, verse 23, where God says, God is not a man that he should lie. I believe that's not a statement physical, but a statement of mental character. What God, like someone could say, I'm not a man that I should lie. I'm not a man who lies. Many people say that. I'm not a man who lies. He's a man that lies. He's a man that lies, but I'm not a man who lies. God is making a statement of mental character, not of his physical nature. Why do I say that? If you turn in Tehillim, Psalms 89, verse 35, God says this, I swore in my wrath that I will not lie unto David. Why would God need to swear that he will not lie unto David if he doesn't lie. If God never lies, then why would he have to swear that he won't lie to David? Why? Because there's a side of God that will lie. Where do we see this? When we turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 22 and also 1 Chronicles, or sorry, 2 Chronicles 18, you will find that that's about King Ahab. And God wants to destroy King Ahab. And the prophet Micah sees a vision in the heavens where by God says, who will go and to destroy, deceive Ahab. And a spirit comes and says that I will. Okay. God says exactly how will you do it? And he says, I will be a lying spirit in all of God's prophets. So here we see, and God approves. And God says, so be it, go. So here we see God approves of a lying spirit coming in the mouths of all the prophets. When if you look in Ezekiel chapter 13, God destroys the false prophets because of lying prophecies. But here you see, God now approves of the lying in all of his prophets. Even Micah, the good prophet, first told a lie to King Ahab under the instruction of God. Which, of course, you see why God says he will not lie unto David, but to others God approves and wants the lie. Okay? But not like man. Numbers 23, I do not lie like man. My lying is for holiness sake. Like also God hates. God said, Jacob I love, Malachi won, but Esau I Hate. It's a hate that is holy. It is a lie that is holy, not like the unholy lies of man, which is for selfishness sake. God's lies is for a holy sake, which he wanted Micah 
and the holy prophets to lie. And that's the context of that. And of course, when you look to, for instance, Isaiah 42, 13, God says, Hashem Yahweh is like a mighty warrior. Okay, a mighty man. You have Exodus 15, verse 3. Yahweh is a man of war. And of course, people choose not to quote those scriptures, but they will quote out of context the meaning of Numbers 23. You have Hosea 11, verse 4. God said, I will draw them with the cords of man. We have the scripture in Ezekiel 43, verse 5 to 7, where Yahweh himself is addressing Ezekiel and he sees Yahweh as a man talking to him. Again, the Yahweh that can be seen. And of course, not to forget Ezekiel chapter 1, where Ezekiel's and Rabbi Akiva's experience and Rabbi Elisha's experience, they see the man sitting on the throne with the likeness of the glory of Yahweh, which caused great controversy in the Jewish world that it says it could never be understood except by Elijah. So there you see man is elevated right to the throne of God, which again brings us back why we believe that Yahweh fears Yahweh. Okay? Meaning in the respect and the awe of who he is. Now, of course, we believe in Proverbs 30, which I read to you before, 4 to 8, it says, Do you know Yahweh's son's name? Tell me if you know. And we believe that that other Yahweh in the flesh was none other than Yesh you are. Well, that's it finished now. I hope it's not been too much for you. You know, please um, write the quotes down and study them. And um, and even if to the end you vehemently oppose or disagree, that's fine. But I hope you understand why Christians uh, believe why there's more than one Yahweh, and that Yahweh truly is the Mashiach, which fears Yahweh, which has always been there, appearing to man from the Garden of Eden all the way through to when Yeshua, yes, made his appearance on earth, and even afterwards, when he continued to appear outside of time to rabbis after the coming of Yeshua. So praise be to Hashem and good evening.